No, I'm not even in it. It's very really nice. Thank you. 
five four three two one good afternoon my brothers and sisters for this is the day that the lord has made and we come to rejoice and be glad in it well y'all didn't hear me for this is the day that the lord has made and we come to rejoice and be glad in it Y'all still not ready for this is the day that the Lord has made and we come to rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let me say it again. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Now, just in case we have forgotten who we really are in God's sight, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 9 and 10 says this, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you may show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. Now, if you've been called out of darkness unto the marvelous light, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Now, verse 10 goes one step further and says, Who once were not a people of God, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Somebody ought to be excited about that. Now, now, because I'm the master of ceremony and Lester Smalls has given me a lot of authority to do some things. After listening to the news in, the, in just the past two weeks and the sadness that it brought about, the mass shootings that was that's still going on in our nation, and it's about 40 year to date now, and we just started the year. The murder of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, the murder murder trial in the lower part of South Carolina, the ice storms from the southwest to the northeast. But I knew the murder of an African American councilwoman in New York, but I knew, you said, what did you know? I knew that on this day, February the 4th, 2023, at 12 noon, despite all that bad news, I was looking forward to saying to each one of you, for this is the day that the Lord has made and we come to rejoice and be glad in it. Now, there's a lot of things that go on that almost causes us to faint when we hear about them. But David said in Psalms 27, 13, I almost fainted unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Let me say that again. Because it was over the last two weeks, there were some devastating things that we have heard. And David just reminded me that I almost fainted. Now, we're talking about the national things that we heard, not to mention things that probably go on in our homes and our families, on our jobs, all the things that we are faced with in the world. And David says, I almost fainted. Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And we are here because we see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In this historic church, Friendship Baptist Church, to the host pastor, Pastor Clinton Edwards, the officers and members of this church, all of the pastors and, and ministers who are here, to the chairman 
of the Martha Schofield Alumni and Legacy Committee, Lester Smalls and the other committee members, to all the local and state officials, to the keynote speaker, Mr. Harold Finnegan, to all uh, the awardees who will be receiving awards, to all of the teachers, alumni, family, and friends of Martha Schofield High School, we have come to celebrate in the Martha Schofield Founders Day and Awards program. And we are thankful to God that he's allowed us to see another day to be a witness of this. Give the Lord another hand clap. Now, there are some arch archival material from Martha Schofield that is held at the Wilson Library at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The collection title is called the Martha Schofield Papers from 1865 to 1869. And also in that same library, you'll find some of the diary of Martha Schofield, some of the things she said, some of the things uh, that she was faced with in living in Aiken, even she talks about visiting African-American churches in Aiken. She gives day-to-day uh, -day, uh, sort of a diary of activities that she experienced while living in Aiken. But here is something that I noted in her papers that she said about our God. She said here, are a few quotes, well, let me, let me do this, let me read this. She says, there's a part of God's divinity in every one of you. He has made you in his own image and planted a portion of his divine nature in your hearts. Think of it, my friend, she says. He has given you light and immortality. Now, remember, she is talking to African Americans shortly after the Civil War, as she and other Quakers came down to help African Americans start schools and learn how to read and write. And let me say further what she says. Let your lives shine by the light he has implanted in you. Listen to the still small voice which will lead you to the golden realm of heaven if you obey. He is a father full of loving kindness and tender mercy. He knows full well the trials, the sorrows, the privations, and the cruelty you have undergone. A sparrow falling not, uh, not the ground, a sparrow falleth not the ground without his notice. A sparrow falleth not from to the ground without his notice. Think you then, he has not watched you every moment of your lives. Now that's something to give God some shout about right there. So I know we're wearing masks and I know we don't want to spit on nobody, but can we give God 30 seconds worth of praise for what he has done? Now, the committee has prepared a program that we will follow as outlined. The opening song, we will sing the Schofield Ode, Scripture, Reverend Louisiana Sanders, Prayer, Reverend William Thompson, Welcome from Friendship, Miss Kimberly Tony, Solo Medley. Mrs. Thelma J. Robinson. The occasion, Reverend Lester Smalls. God's words and well wishes, Dr. Walter B. Curry, Jr. Miss Beverly Asa Muhammad, granddaughter of Dr. Matilda Evans. Miss Michelle Fassler Garcia, 
Reconstruction Era Network in Beaufort. Mr. Alan Reddick, Aiken County Historical Society. And Dr. Bobby Donaldson, Associate Professor of History, Director of the Center for Civil Rights History and Research at the University of South Carolina, Columbia. And then we'll have another selection, the Mount Hill Baptist Church Choir. And I will come back after that. Let's give God a hand type of praise for what he's going to do in this service. <laughs> we'll now sing the Scofield Old Letter Stain. Sunshine falls, clouds are us. Breezes ring round the walls, lids of Martha Schofield. Martha Schofield, strong and true. Martha Schofield, ever. Schofield, we sing to you, faithful we forever. We remember in the years coming swiftly toward us. All the smiles but not the tears. Martha Schofield brought us. Martha Schofield started to. Martha Schofield answered. Schofield peace and you. Please in the path of my children, on the to you, who will guide the way. feels strong and true. Father, so First, giving honor to God, who's the head of my life. Protocol has already been established. I'm so thankful for that. To the pastor of this great church and to the committee that organized this wonderful Founders Day. I will be coming from the book First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, starting with verse 12 through 22. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exalt you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 
Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, honoring our leaders. Amen. Let us stand for prayer, please. Most gracious Father, we come this day, this afternoon, calling upon the holy and divine name, dear Lord. Asking, dear Lord, that your divine spirit move within all the hearts and minds of the year. With this special and momentous occasion, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, enlighten us what it means. Bless us to bring about a light that shines within our hearts, minds, and souls. That we, dear God, will exemplify thee and do that which is within the calling of our coming here today. It will bring you joy, peace, and for everlasting love. In Jesus' name we pray your seventh prayer. Amen. Protocol has been established. We welcome you to Friendship Baptist Church, where you all have been here as uh, st students of Martha Schofield, where you are friends and family, and it's like a class reunion, where we're here on a good occasion to celebrate. We welcome you on behalf of the Martha Schofield Historical Society or the committee, committee and on Friendship Baptist Church on behalf of our pastor, Reverend T.C. Edwards. We welcome you to the place that where many, many years ago, Martha Schofield was here for programs and also in honor of our Ada Boynton who was here and did mighty great works here in, in the musical department and in our, her ministry and for Founders Day. And we welcome you. It is not it is not a welcome for those that have been here before. It's just a welcome home. Have a great night. Good afternoon to everyone. There were some songs that were sung in the era, songs that were arranged and written in the late 1800s. Some of those songs are still being sung today. And I just want to indulge you just a bit with a medley of some songs that African Americans sang other congregations sang touching songs of sorrow and songs of jubilee because this is what it's all about being refreshed in the midst of a storm up above my head i hear music in the air up above my head, I hear music in the air. Up above my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a heaven song. Somewhere up above my head, I hear singing in the air. Up above my head, I hear singing in the air. Up above my head, I hear singing in the air. There must be a heaven some, somewhere. 
shine on me. Oh, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse shine on me. Oh, shine on me. Oh, shine on me. Let the light from the lighthouse, oh, shine on, on me. Gonna lay down my burden down by the riverside. Down by the riverside, down by the riverside, I'm gonna lay down my burden. Down by the riverside to study, study war no more. Oh, I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study, study war no more. Oh, I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study, study war no more. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, I want to be, I want to be, I want to be in that number, oh. Go marching in. Oh, when they crown him, Lord of Lords. When they crown him, Lord of Lords. Oh, do you want to be, want to be, want to be in that number? Oh, when the saints go marching in, well, I'm gonna lay down my burden down by the riverside, down by the riverside, down by the riverside. I'm gonna lay down my heavy, my heavy burden down by the river side. Steady, steady war, no more. Well, I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the river side. I'm gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the river sun to study, study war no more. Well, how I got over my love, how I got over my love. You know my soul look back and wonder how I got old, over, how I got over, my Lord, how I made it over, oh Lord, you know my soul look back and wonder how I got over, well, 
Just as strong as I can see Jesus. The man who died for me. The man that bled and suffered. You know he hung him on Calvary. I want to thank him for how he kept me. I never thank him because he never have loved me. And I'm going to thank him for all he done for me. the spirit of the true and living God to uh, Reverend Dr. Zachary Johnson, our MC for the day presider to the pastor of this church, Reverend uh, Clinton T.C. Edwards and the Friendship Church family to all of our pulpit guests and program guests, our awardees and to all of our visitors. This is a great day that the Lord has made. And we all want to be thankful as we live in it. Amen. Amen. I, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the occasion. The, the occasion. The occasion is uh, when I think about the occasion, I think about how God often when his people, his covenant people were, get a little stressed or a little troubled, he would always remind them of from whence he brought them. He would always say, look back, do you remember when? He would always say that uh, uh, I did this for you. I gave you manna from heaven. I made a way out of no way. And that's what this occasion is about. Apostle Paul says, and my God will provide all of your needs according to his riches and glory. But well, this is a moment that's evident, that evidence is that God does provide all of our needs. And he, he gives, he provides those needs through wonderful people as Martha Schofield. And through wonderful people as we are celebrating today and, and those that will be awarded today and to wonderful people as yourself, he does provide all of our needs. And as we, this occasion is about a lady who followed the will of God, and certainly she, she strove even through sickness and through the barriers of resistance and prejudice and all kinds of challenges, she continued to strive to fulfill that goal to establish an institution that would instill betterment in our lives. So we just thank God for this day. As I close, I think of one word that comes to mind when I think of Martha Schofield is the word capacity. In other words, the capacity to endure. First of all, she had capacity to love. She had the capacity to sacrifice. She had the capacity to, to continue to push even when she felt like she couldn't go any further. But she never lost sight of the mission of God. And when I think about this day, this day is one that we ought to say, when I think about the goodness of God, I just want to shout hallelujah. When I think about it, when I look back, look back from whence we come, and the thing about that, God would always tell Israel, look back to the better days. In the book of, in the book of Isaiah, it says, go back to the crossroad, mm -hmm. to the good way. And that's what looking back is about. Yeah. It's looking back to those days when mom and them didn't take no mess. Am I right about it? So the occasion is, let's celebrate. 
but look back at those values from which, by which God brought us and let us continue to look forward, not forgetting what God has brought us from behind. God bless you. Welcome to all of us. Good afternoon. Protocol has been established. I am delighted to be here. And Reverend Johnson, Saturday, well, Sunday is tomorrow, but we have a church now. <laughs> and, and it's great because I feel that when God is in the midst, yes. it is church every day. Yes. And just to really set the context for this wonderful occasion as we celebrate the life and legacy of Martha Schofield. This scripture came, comes to mind. And I used to listen and read this scripture when I was coming up. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verse one, it says that the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of bones. And then he caused me to pass by them all around and behold, there were many in the open valley and indeed they were very dry. And he said unto, said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And so I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and said to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter into you and you shall live. Now I'm gonna stop there because when you think about the legacy of life of Martha Schofield, when she started right here in the beautiful city of Aiken, the Civil War ended in 1865. There were thousands and thousands of freedmen across South Carolina who were illiterate. Many of them were. And there was no schools around this area that provided a solid and quality education. A lot of them were my ancestors, the Seawrights and the Thompsons from Wagner South, many families from that area, right here in Aiken County. But one thing that Martha Schofield saw in my ancestors and all of the freedmen, she saw that they had potential, they had life, and they were not dry bones. And she came to give them the word of God through education. And for me, that's enough to say thankful because she was a lady that been through so much, who sacrificed her time, her money, her influence for African-American children to be educated, not only here in Aiken County, but beyond Aiken County, who has done wonderful things, who are making a difference in this community, in South Carolina and beyond. And so in moving forward, these four individuals who will come forth, who will provide words of wisdom, comfort, and will touch on the life and legacy of Martha Schofield. The first individual will be Miss Beverly Asa Muhammad who is the granddaughter of the legendary 
Dr. Matilda Evans. Dr. Evans was a mentee to Martha Schofield. In fact, she wrote a book about Martha Schofield and her life. And I'm so blessed at this time to introduce Miss Muhammad. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I come to you in peace. I am so honored to be in your company today. In the name of Allah God, given honor and all praises to the creator of us all. For his continued guidance and comfort as we journey through this strange dimension that we call life. First of all, I would like to thank my beloved cousin, an extraordinary man, called to do an extraordinary work, Dr. Walter Curry, for his research and the recording of our history. I would also like to thank Lester, Reverend Lester Smalls, president of the Schofield Legacy Committee. I would like to thank our honored keynote Doctor, um, well, Harold Finnegan and Reverend Clinton Edwards, pastor of Friendship Baptist Church. And thank you, Dr. Bobby Donaldson, for all you have done and continue to do. And of course, I would be remiss if I did not thank my husband, Captain Timothy Muhammad for his love and support. I wish to thank all those who have done so much to keep the legacy of Martha Schofield alive. Dear saints, I say this with all confidence, your toils shall reap an imaginable reward and you shall be honored all the days of your life. My name is Beverly Aiken Muhammad. I am the oldest granddaughter of Dr. Matilda Evans, who was born in 1872, right here in Aiken, South Carolina, a mere seven years after the Civil War to Anderson and Harriet Evans. Dr. Evans is the, was the first black doctor, male or female, to be licensed in the state of South Carolina in 1897. By 1910, she had founded two hospitals. She had also founded a very prestigious nursing school. She co-founded the first black medical association in the state of South Carolina, the Negro Health Association. And she along with Ms. Majeska Simpkins literally revolutionized children's health and sanitation in the segregated schools of that day. Dr. Evans was also recruited to train black male interns who were sent to her from Harvard University School of Medicine. Today, the capital city of Columbia, South Carolina, is in the process of building a downtown business district right off Bull Street and has named the main street of that district Dr. Matilda Evans Street. I'm immensely proud of my grandmother, Dr. Matilda A. Evans. Dr. Evans slipped away from the surly entanglement of oppression and brutality of her era, and she saw beyond the horizon. She understood what is written in the book of Romans, fifth chapter, third and fourth verses that state, suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character and character produces hope. 
But I truly believe with all my heart that if Dr. Evans was present today and in attendance with us today, she would take all the accolades we say of her and shake her head and say, no, no, no. She would then point her finger to that mighty educator and pioneer, Martha Schofield. For there would be no Dr. Matilda Evans if God had not sent a Martha Schofield Amen. on a mission Amen. right here in Jim Crow, Aiken, South Carolina. Amen. 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 To God be the glory. But don't take my word for it, saints. Let me read to you what Dr. Evans wrote herself in 1916 as a testimony to Martha Schofield and what she wanted us to always remember about Martha Schofield. I'm going to read just a few excerpts from my book about Dr. Evans, A Case for Separation. I have a gift. Um, for our honored uh, guests and the gift of the book to Reverend Smalls and one to Reverend Edwards. Don't let me go back home. <laughs> At my age, I do forget sometimes. Dr. Evans wrote these words and I'll now share them with you. She said, Miss Martha Schofield was the most solicitous concerning the difficulties which the Negro problem would occasion, especially when the colored race reaches that stage of development when requests are made at the present time for certain rights become demands which cannot be ignored or disposed of by trickery and hypocritical legislation. Martha Schofield, she said, felt and believed that by enlightenment through education, the day would inevitably come when the Negro would be controlled only by affording him every right to which he may be entitled. Dr. Evans continued, she said she, Dr. Uh, Martha Schofield, had great confidence that education would also improve the intelligence and the morals of the white people, that they would have too much respect for their own manhood as to not prostitute it by declining to grant absolute justice to the race. Amen. She said Martha Schofield really believed, and she said she also believed. She said Martha Schofield really believed and asked the author, meaning herself, whom she reared from a little child and educated also believes that plutocracy, meaning a country or a society governed by the wealthy, was of course the most rightful and frightful monster to be encountered and overcome, but it must be at all hazards. In the philosophy of Martha Schofield, Dr. Evans writes, education, instead of violence, was the weapon for that purpose. Education that is proper and well-rounded also enforces all who embrace it into a line of work which promises the accomplishment of great achievements and truly do give new heart, truly gives new hope, truly gives new courage to our weaker brothers and sisters. Dr. Evans continues by quoting from Martha Schofield, when the final history of the war between ignorance and enlightenment, between superstition and science, between vice and virtue is written of the colored race, the foremost name among them all will be Martha Schofield, pioneer, Negro educator. These words were written by my grandmother, a graduate of Martha Schofield School. 
and she published them in 1916. So on behalf of the grandchildren of Dr. Evans, myself, Beverly Aitken Muhammad, my brother James Evans Aitken, my sister Alga Marvin Aitken Swanson, and our first cousin Mary Agnes Evans Smalls, we thank you, we honor you, and we pray that God will always bless you with strength and perseverance. Thank you. That was very powerful. Every word that she said came from the heart. Very powerful, inspirational words. Thank you, Ms. Beverly Asa Muhammad, for sharing not only the life or legacy of Dr. Matilda Evans, but also the life and legacy of Martha Schofield through the work of Dr. Matilda Evans. At this time, I am happy to introduce Ms. Michelle Fassler Garcia from the Reconstruction Era Network in Beaufort. and invigorating energy that has just been shared. Um, wow, I'm overwhelmed with the positivity and just I'm very honored um, that the committee um, and Dr. Curry invited me here today. I'm here representing Reconstruction Era National Historical Park in Beaufort and our Reconstruction Era National Historic Network. Um, it's a fairly new network and the goal is to learn, share, highlight these stories um, of the reconstruction era on a national scale. Um, the Schofield norm Normal and Industrial School, it's a mouthful, uh, was, was our network's um, very first Aiken site. Um, now we have two Aiken sites part of the network. Hopefully that is growing. We um, have 89 sites total in our network and 20 of them are in South Carolina, which South Carolina is rich in this powerful history. Um, and again, I'm so just so humbled to hear this so that the goal is to take this back to my park, share it with park visitors, share it with my children, share it with my family um, so that they can come learn about Martha Schofield, um, learn about Dr. Evans, um, I wish you guys held this every day so visitors from all over could come and experience this. Um, I had this whole thing written out, but <laughs> I was so moved and um, all of this seems just backtracking now. Um, Martha Schofield's legacy of education and philanthropy continues today. It's apparent. Um, her history and the, the scholarships, from what I understand, um, we're excited to share those stories of Martha and the people of Aiken with national and international audiences through our network. It is amazing to truly stop and think about how these stories live on through events like this, sparking inspiration within current and future generations of leaders in civic engagement and other areas of community. Um, again, I, it, it's impossible to follow up <laughs> with all of just the amazing speakers and singers um, that we've had. And thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle, for your remarks. And just want to add, uh, the Reconstruction Era Network um, is a collection of historical sites dating from the Reconstruction Era uh, which um, according to um, the law um, from 1860 all the way to 1900. And there are several um, sites of the Reconstruction Era Network here in South Carolina, um, several of them here um, in um, Aiken County, 
Um, she mentioned um, Schofield. Um, the bell tower that you see in front of Schofield Middle School is a part of the Reconstruction Era Network. Also, the Center for African American History, Art and Culture. Um, Juanita Campbell, who's executive director, doing a wonderful job there. And also the Hamburg Carsville um, Historical Site um, by my good friend Wayne O'Brien um, and his committee um, promoting um, Hamburg and Carsville. And so you get a chance to um, learn more about those sites through uh, the Reconstruction Era Network. I want to introduce uh, Mr. Alan Riddick, who I call the Dean of Aiken County History. And the reason why I say that, because Alan has been working so diligently and hard to document Aiken County history. And he's responsible for many of the historical markers that you see throughout the county. And so at this time, um, Mr. Allen Riddick, who is the president of the Aiken County Historical Society. Thank you, Dr. Curry. Can y'all hear me? Well, good afternoon. It, it is great to be here, especially on this occasion for Martha Schofield. And um, actually, it's a doubly a special occasion because we're in this historic 1866 Friendship Baptist Church, this beautiful church. And, um, and I would like to thank uh, Reverend Smalls for uh, inviting me today. I wish we, when we have our historical meetings, we don't have quite this many people to attend, but uh, maybe one day we will, so. Um, but I do want to mention just uh, some of the historical markers that um, Dr. Curry mentioned, that that is the one thing that we try and do uh, as a historical society. We try and mark places around the county the whole county, not just Aiken. Um, so there is a historical marker actually being made at right at this, as we speak, it is for Friendship Baptist Church. I, I, I think most church members probably don't even know. I've been working with the history committee and this, this actually came about, uh, we applied for a grant last year with this thing, uh, a, a Watson Brown Corporation, where they, they have $30,000 every year that they give to historical groups. And we have applied twice and we have been awarded $2,500 each time to, and that's how much the markers are today. Uh, we, we got one for um, Aiken Graded School several years back, and we've also done one for Schofield School, which that's why we're here today, of course. And, and the one coming up, I'm not sure when it's going to be ready. It'll be ready later this month or early in March. So at that time, we will decide about a ceremony but it will be placed right outside the church, right along Richland Avenue. And it's gonna be a, a great addition to this uh, structure, this church. Um, and I would like to mention another historical marker that we're working on. We're working with a group in Wagner, a group from the A.L. Corbett School. A.L. Corbett was uh, built in 1954 as a, great, a school for all grades. And uh, unfortunately, most of it has been torn down except the gym and the cafeteria. But in working with the Alumni Association, they do want to do this marker for the school. And we hope to, we have actually been approved for the wording, but 
they have a few questions. The committee has a few questions about the actual wording. So we're, we're going between the committee and the people in Columbia to get it right. And then at some point, hopefully later this year, we'll have a ceremony in Wagner and everybody will be invited, of course. And, and I do want to mention one more marker that we're, will be next down the pipe would be um, for the McGee and McGee building here in Aiken. Just, just right down Richland Avenue, the McGee and McGee building, and actually Bill McGee is here. He knows a little bit about that. <laughs> and, uh, and also that was the site of uh, Dr. C.C. C. Johnson's third drugstore right there on the corner. So, so all that, that marker will include all that information about McGee and McGee and Dr. C.C. C. Johnson. So I just wanted to bring you that information on this uh, special day, historic day. Um, and if y'all ever have any questions about any markers or anything, I am in the phone book, so to speak, and, I, and I'll be glad to talk to you. So thank y'all very much. Thank you, Alan, for your remarks. Um, a lot of historical markers are being put up in the African-American community. So we need to get excited about that because many of our history has not been taught properly, but now is being put out on public display. And I um, just want to add to that um, the Schofield School marker um, is near the bell tower in front of Schofield Middle School. And so the bell tower and the Schofield marker um, is our pictures on the Reconstruction Era Network um, site. And so, Alan, thank you for the update. Thank you for your, your words. Last, I am proud to introduce someone who I consider a son of Aiken County. You know, one thing my grandmother used to say is it's important to take care of people outside the home, but it's more important to take care of people inside the home. And I found it not robbery to call Dr. Bobby Donaldson a son of Aiken County. I'm a young uh, historian myself, and I believe that it's important for myself and others who want to be great at something is to learn from others who have done the work. And I can say to you, Dr. Bobby Donaldson, I have learned a great deal from your work. And not only that, I've learned so much about your work as it relates to civil rights history in South Carolina. And not only he's the son of Aiken County, but he is the dean of civil rights history in South Carolina. The reason why you see a lot of activity going on in promoting civil rights in South Carolina because of the work of Dr. Bobby Donaldson and his staff and his colleagues at the University of South Carolina. And so at this time, I am happy to bring up Dr. Bobby Donaldson. Good afternoon. I am honored to come back home to Aiken County today. The date was March the 8th of 1888. A very distinguished American citizen had come to South Carolina. He wanted to examine the consequences, the aftermath of the Reconstruction period. And so he travels by train from Washington, D.C., and he comes to Charleston, he goes to Columbia, he passes through Aiken, and then he goes to Augusta, and he speaks before an organization. And it is said at that occasion, on March 8, 1888, he was greeted by a school teacher 
from Aiken named Martha Schofield. That gentleman who boarded a train in Washington and who came to South Carolina was named Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass studied the conditions in the aftermath of Reconstruction. He examined efforts to weaken black voting power. He examined efforts to rob black people of their land. And he examined efforts to undermine education in this state. He also examined efforts to weaken to silence, to overlook the history of black people. And so he goes back to Washington, DC, and he writes a lengthy column about what he witnessed of the wretched condition of black people. And Frederick Douglass said something in 1888, Reverend Smalls and Dr. Curry, that seems fitting and appropriate this afternoon. He said, I have a duty to perform. And that duty is to tell the history. It is to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It is not well to forget the past, he said. The past is the mirror in which we may see the outlines of the future. He said the nation has a habit of forgetting the past. But black people must keep the past alive until justice is done. Today we gather in this historic church to keep the past alive. 1888, in October of 1937, another prominent American citizen spoke to an organization called the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, a group established by the eminent scholar, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who planted the seed for African American History Month. In 1937, the president of Dr. Woodson's organization was a woman who was born on the outskirts of a small town called Maysville. Her name was Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, a woman who once spoke on the grounds of Schofield High School. In 1937, Dr. Bethune was deeply concerned as Douglas that the history of African Americans was intentionally and deliberately being misconstrued. She believed in Dr. Woodson's words about the miseducation of black people. He said this in 1937, if our people are to fight their way out of bondage, we need to arm them with a sword and a shield, a belief in themselves and their possibilities. And we need to teach our history from the kindergarten to the grave. And to do so at whatever cost, even if it breaks the back of the kingdom. And if, we, if we've ever needed the words of Frederick Douglass and Dr. Bethune, we need them today. <laughs> the final date I want to offer is June 5th, 1946. June 5th, 1946, the Aiken newspaper ran articles about graduation day in schools in this community. On the front page of the Aiken paper, there was a headline story about the graduates of Aiken High School. On the last page of the newspaper, the back page was a story about the graduates of Schofield. The reason why this article was so important to me and why it was important for me to turn from the front page to the back page is that the president of the class of 1946 was my grandmother, Ruby Doris Williams. 
Mama, as I call her, was the wisest woman I knew. I am a professor of history because she too was a historian. Her love for history was shaped and molded on the grounds of Schofield. A few years ago, Reverend Smalls was kind enough to send me a copy of my grandmother's high school yearbook. And it told me a lot about her that I never knew. Her nickname on the campus was Granny. They said Mama was an old soul. And as I look at her life, she was just that. She was the only woman in our family to finish high school. She had aspirations that were cut short. When we were growing up, we lived in public housing project in Augusta called Delta Manor on East Boundary. But mama in that neighborhood was a nurse. She was a social worker. She was a counselor. Several friends of hers could not read and they couldn't write. So they would bring the documents to mama and she would decipher them for her friends and she would sometimes sign their name. Those critical skills she learned at Schofield. But Mama was not from Aiken, the city. Mama was from the suburbs, <laughs> near, the, near the intersection of Highway 278 and Green Pond Road. You may have heard of it. We call it Petticoat Junction. <laughs> and she, every morning, she would get on the back of a truck from Petticoat Junction to come to Schofield. She understood the words, the words that say, be not conformed by this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. I'm grateful to God that mama's mind was transformed at Schofield. Today we come to this great church to celebrate the legacy of Martha Schofield and all of the young men and women shaped on this campus. The very same year that Frederick Douglass came this way, Martha Schofield went to a studio for a portrait. That portrait is now in the archives at Chapel Hill. On the back of that portrait, she wrote the following. I am doing the duty of the day and I'm trusting God for the results. Faithful work today is a sure foundation for tomorrow. And so today we come to celebrate the elders' good report and the faithful work planted on the grounds of Schofield. Today we come not only to celebrate, but we come, we come to acknowledge our own duty and our own commission, our own homework assignment. That assignment is this, write the vision and make it plain. Make it plain on tablets, make it plain on history, that those who read it thereafter may be educated, may be encouraged, may be edified, and they may be inspired. We may be inspired to run on to see what our end shall be. Thank you very much.
bless God right there for the promise. Hallelujah. Let the church say amen for all that has been done thus far. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Before Deacon Rudolph Hall comes, I want to do something here a little special and have been given leeway by the chairman to do so. I first want to recognize all of those who graduated from Martha. Schofield High School. That would be 1970 and earlier. Would you stand? <laughs> now you, you, are, you all remain standing. Then we want to recognize all those who attended Martha Schofield High School but made the transition taken high after integration. You stand. Everybody except the class of 1970, you can be seated. Now, the class of 1970, as you know, we were the last senior graduating class. I was a part of that class. The graduated in 1970, which now makes all of us at least 70. Uh, that's three score and 10. Now, my question to all of you, have you ever seen a better looking group of 70 plus birthdays? <laughs> I didn't think so. And we are thankful that God allowed us. In fact, when we were to celebrate our 50th class reunion, it was in the middle of COVID in 2020, so it was canceled at that time. We're going to do it at some point, but I just want to say I thank God that he allowed us to live to be here, to witness. Now, now I'm saying we're the babies. So there's a lot of others in here who are older than us and even have even more so to be thankful for. There's some 80 plus, there's probably even maybe a 90 plus, but we have thank God, we thank God that we are here. Now, my friend Rudolph, my friend, my brother, come on up Rudolph and give the appeal. And certainly we thank him for what he has done as our class leader of the class of 1970. And let me mention this before I take my seat. After the appeal and the offering, you have the introduction of the keynote speaker, Dr. Walter B. Curry, Jr. Keynote speaker, Mr. Harold Finnegan, awards presentation by the committee. You know, Reverend Smalls, Reverend Johnson, it's difficult to do what I was asked to come up and do. I want to do so, say so much, but my former pastor by the name of Joseph S. Harrison says, do what you were asked to do. <laughs> Lord, I really want to say so much more. <laughs> But I'm going to do what I was asked to do. And that is the appeal for your giving. I would ask that you give not from your pocket, 
but from your heart. If you haven't heard anything said up to now that touches your heart, you might need to go get an EKG. <laughs> there was an old deacon back in the day that used to start off offerings, and I'm going to leave him anonymous, by pulling out a $100 bill. See, I'm going to get it started. And at the end of <clears throat> offering, they would have collected about $128. <laughs> so I know that's not effective to dazzle me with how much I'm going to give. If you need to write a check, and my class members and those before us are probably the only ones that still write checks. But if you need to write a check, make it out to the Martha Schofield Legacy Association. If you need the cash app, nah, nah, that's, that's, you, that's you young folk. I, I know where I'm going to give you right where you should cash app it to. Cash app, dollar sign, MS, 1868. Dollar sign, MS, 1868. And for those of you that are big ballers, <laughs> you can drop all the cash you want to in the basket. Let us yield. If you will, from the back forward, just come up um, on this side. Just come out the street, come around. And if you do the same on the other side, just come out, come around. Oh, he's a keeper. He's a keeper. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's a keeper. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's the keeper. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's the keeper. Yes, he is. Yes, he is.
Let us all stand. Father, we thank you for this time of giving. Thank you for making provisions for us to have something to give. And we pray, Father, as a result of this offering that it be used for the upbuilding of the kingdom and for the work that needs to be done in the community. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It is my sincere honor to introduce the keynote speaker, Mr. Harold Finnegan from Darby, Pennsylvania. Harold Finnegan is on a mission to educate and to promote sustainability and historic preservation. In 2004, he created a consulting design and construction firm which implements the principles of building science, moisture control, ventilation, alternative heating and cooling strategies and energy efficiency. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from St. Joseph's University and his master's degree in organizational dynamics from the University of Pennsylvania. Mr. Finnegan has decades of teaching secondary social studies, health, business and information technology grades K through 12, as well as serving as the Director of Education for the Energy Coordinating Agency of Philadelphia. As founder, CEO, and head coach of Just Row, Darby, Pennsylvania, Mr. Finnegan pioneered this innovative program designed to develop athletic, nutritional, academic, and career life plans for inner city youth. This program was absorbed by the school district of Philadelphia. He has also been the past general manager, head coach for Bar Bachelors Barge Club, the oldest rowing club in the US. During his tenure there, he developed and coached over three dozen national and Olympic team athletes. He has numerous presentations and courses that he has taught. Just to name a few, Boy Scouts of Delaware, where Pennsylvania began, Quaker influence in the founding of Pennsylvania and our country. W.M. Penn School District, Lansdowne, Pennsylvania, how to save 20 million on a 15 million building rehab. Ardmore Avenue School, a case study. Darby Creek Valley Association, while things fell apart, nobody paid much attention. The Darby Friends Meeting, the Darby Quakers, and their struggle against slavery. Structural stabilization of the Darby Meeting House and short biography of Martha Schofield. Mr. Finnegan is an energetic natural leader, educator, and team builder with a record of achievement and recognition, reflecting in program development, organizational management, coaching, and fundraising with visionary ability. 
highly principled, hardworking, and motivated. He meets challenging professional demands and accelerates individual performance through strengths in strategic planning, relationship building, and a talent for creating an environment that fosters dedication and purpose. At this time, I have the pleasure to introduce Mr. Harold Finnegan. Hi folks, thank you all for having me here. I have to say uh, I have one fault, and that is as I get older, it gets harder to read. So typically when I give presentations, I have a laptop here. The problem is that we weren't set up for that. So I might have to move around so I can see the screen a little bit better, and I hope you don't mind. Uh, my wife tells me that I'm loud enough, so uh, maybe I'll need a microphone, but I don't think so. So um, let me just give you a little background and then we'll begin the presentation. So I'm a member of the Darby Friends Meeting. The Darby Friends Meeting uh, last year had their 340th anniversary, and that's old, okay? In preparation for that, I began about five years before to do some research on the Darby meeting. What you're gonna to see today is uh, a piece of that research. The larger research uh, I did back on election day, actually, as a in-service day for the social studies teachers in our school district, and it was a five-hour program to give you detail. So anyway, I want to thank you all for coming, and let's go with the first slide. So what I'm going to look at here is, and this is my point in the conversation that I had with Dr. Curry, is what made Martha Schofield the remarkable person that she was. Uh, as you can see, she was a nurse, an educator, a reformer, a founder, a fundraiser, a civil rights and temperance advocate, a feminist, and a suffragette. It makes us all think we've been wasting our lives. Okay, next. So what I've done is if you want to know more about a subject, you'll find on many of my slides a picture of a book. And it's a book from which you can go back and find more detail on that subject. Okay, next. So also, this is about history. And not all of history is pleasant, but it's important. It's important we know where we've come from. It's important we know where we are. It's important we know where we're going. Next. So this is a picture of the inside of the meeting house. And what I am going to show in this presentation is that Martha, and particularly her mother Mary, were brought up in a very unique environment by people whose character and choices were shaped by their values. And the passage to the next generation of those values and ways to act was paramount in their worldview. They saw education as the key to reforming a corrupt and selfish society which had fallen from the grace of God. Service above self and the seeking of the inner light was the way to know the path forward. Next. So who are the society of friends? They're just everyday people. Next. So the Society of Friends was an evangelical movement of Christianity begun in the 1650s in England. It was in response to the mayhem of the English Civil War. By proportion, more people were killed in the English Civil War than even in World War I. The country was traumatized from this event. Next. So core Quaker ideas, which were very radical at the time, but today may, we may recognize them. First of all, they were strict Christians following the teachings of Jesus. Their idea was that God communicates directly with every person. And without the aid of ordained clergy, people don't need churches, rituals, holy days, or sacraments to practice religion. Instead, religion should be something that you carry out every day in how you interact with the world. They believed that their shared purpose was to model an alternative society 
and to challenge others to do the same. And you should be willing to put your life on the line for your beliefs. I remarked when I was sitting through what I observed today that is quite different from a Quaker meeting. A Quaker meeting, you sit in silence and don't get up unless you have something to contribute. Very different. Next. So early Quaker values are four. Very simple. Okay. First of all, simplicity. A, per a person's spiritual life and character are more important than the quantity of goods he possesses or his monetary worth. One should use their resources deliberately in ways that are most likely to make life truly better, not for you, for the community. Okay? Truth. One should promote and act in truthfulness at all times. Next is equality. Quakers do not acknowledge class, race, or gender inequality, believing that all people possess an inner light by which God reveals himself. And finally, the testimony to peace, that nonviolent confrontation of evil and peaceful reconciliation are always superior to violent measures. Next. So England was organized like this. The top 1% owns 35%, the bottom 92% own 10%. Sound familiar today? <laughs> Next. So the Quakers traveled around Europe preaching their values. Consequently, they were seen as heretics and troublemakers by the establishment. And the message of equality was very popular among the 92%. Next. So. William Penn was the son of an English admiral. He was brought up in the Anglican faith, and he saw the consequences of the religious persecution and political struggles of the English Civil War. By the age of 22, he had converted to the Society of Friends. Next. So during the mid, this is a joke here, during the mid uh, 1600s, English King Charles borrowed heavily from Penn's father. When William Penn his father died in 1680, he went to the king to collect the debt. Problem was, the king was broke because he had lent money, he had borrowed money and spent it on the war. By the way, that's a King Charles Spaniel, and you get exactly why it was named after him. Next. Thank you. Next. Okay. So, the king had an idea. He didn't have any money, but what he's going to do is he's going to give Penn land over there in the New World and talk them into naming it Pennsylvania, which means Penn's Woods. And Penn didn't like that because he thought that it was in violation of testimony to simplicity. And he's like, well, we're not naming it after you, after your dad. Oh, okay. So anyway, the idea was take all of your crazy followers and get out, oh, I'm sorry, and take them with you over to the, the new land. Next. So, how Penn sold this to the other Quakers was he, he came up with the idea of the holy experiment. So what he suggested was that we're going to create a new country, a new colony, based on Quaker ideals. This was to be an intentional community, and this is very important. An intentional community based on the teachings of Jesus and simplicity, truth, peace, and equality. And it would serve as a model for mankind to demonstrate what could be achieved if people followed Christ's teachings and worked together for their mutual benefit. Next. So, ironically, William Penn and some 70% of the Quakers were slaveholders, as was the custom of the day. However, the seven families of 23 people that came from Derbyshire, England, or Derby, England, were not. And what was different about them is that they saw slavery as inconsistent with the vision that William Penn was presenting to them. Okay, so 
they began a, a 90 year struggle to begin to convince their brethren of the error of their ways. Today, we might refer to the Darby Quakers as awake. If I was giving this presentation in Philadelphia, I would use a different word, okay? But not to ruffle any feathers. Next. So what does awake mean? Awake recognizes that mainstream Anglo-American society is based on the idea of white male hierarchical supremacy. Any questions? <laughs> Moving on. Okay. So remember that the Quakers left Great Britain specifically to establish an alternative society, not to replicate the problems of Europe. Next. So why were the Darby Quakers awake? I had that question. And I was trying to find out in the records, you know, why, but they obviously you don't write down what you already know. Okay, so then I had a brainwave when I was sitting home doing nothing during lockdown. I contacted the mothership. I contacted the Darby Quakers in Darby, England. Okay, because that's where they came from. And I said, are there any old geezers that have more white hair than I that are historians in this time period? And I found a few. And what I found was that the Darby Quakers had been singled out for persecution much more heavily than their brethren. Many had been branded, many had been whipped, many had had all of their possessions taken from them, many had been put in jail. One, a, a uh, relative of Martha Schofield had been burned at the stake, okay, for their beliefs. Next. I also found out something very interesting, that how the Quakers got from England and Ireland to America was that Penn hired 22 ships to bring them there. At least one ship, I think two, blew off course and ended up in a place called Barbados in the West Indies. Okay? From the records, it appears that the Derby Quakers were on board. Unfortunately, there's not uh, records of who the passengers were, but there is record of who the cargo belonged to because they had to pay tax. And some of the cargo belongs to some of the Darby Quakers. So I'm assuming that they were on board along with their stuff. Next. So what would you find in Barbados? Barbados, a tiny island about 19 by 19 miles square, ends up being the most important colony of all the colonies that the British had. And what they did there was perfect two things. The growing of sugar, which became wildly popular, and slavery, okay? So the shipments of sugar were worth more from this little island than everything produced in North America combined at that time. That's how valuable this was. Next. The conditions on Barbados were so brutal for the slaves that the life expectancy was between three and seven years. Okay? Because they figured out a business model. And the business model was, it was way cheaper to pay, to, to provide you with half rations and not really any medical attention and give you, you know, like some hut over there and when you died off, we're just gonna replace you. That was cheaper than to treat you with dignity. This is what the Darby Quakers would have witnessed. Next. Here at this British colony, the British perfected chattel slavery. The British Colonial Assembly codified the following. Any African brought to the island was declared as property not human. Secondly, the status would remain in bondage, slaves, sorry, slaves would remain in bondage for life, and that status would be passed on to their children. This becomes the template 
for African servitude in the Americas. We call it chattel slavery. The penalty for revolt was to do what happened to Martha, ancestor, burn him at the stake. Next. So how did the English justify slavery? Three things. First, they said, well, Christian principles, they only ap apply to Christians. Okay. So Jesus' teachings don't apply to non-Christians. What did the Quakers that saw the evil in this do? They opened up Sunday schools. It only lasted for a while, then they got shut down. So then the second argument of the plantation owners was that slaves aren't really fully people. And why do we know that? Because they can't speak English. Right? <laughs> It, it shocks me because not too many years ago, I heard about a te Texas legislator that wasn't interested in bilingual forms in her state uh, because she said that it was gonna be Spanish and English. She said, because as we all know that Jesus spoke English. So anyway, um, we don't need those other languages. So they said, well, because these people can't speak English, they're obviously not really human. Obviously, the kidnapped people spoke their native language. When I taught at Bartram High School in Philadelphia, we had maybe 30% of the students that came in were off the battlefield from West Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Mali. Some of them spoke English. Many of them, their first language was French. And they usually spoke four to five native languages to go along with it which tops me, I, I'm, I got two, that's it. Finally, they said, you know what? We don't have a choice. Slave labor is integral to capitalism and that's our business model, okay? It is required to plant and harvest tobacco, sugar cane, cotton and rice. The plantation system is the linchpin for trade, textiles, banking, insurance, shipping and the food industries. So slave owners created the idea of white supremacy to justify themselves. This is why what the Quakers saw when they stopped at Barbados and what they were affected by. Next. So in the fall of 1682, the village and township of Darby is settled by this group of Quakers. They disallow, so when, when Penn set it up, each township had a meeting house. So in Quaker speak, meeting house equals church, okay? And the meeting house is both the town hall and it is the church. And when they set up, and each meeting is responsible for their area. When the Darby meeting set up, they said, we're not having slaves. And also, you're not transport excuse me, transporting slaves through our territory, okay? So the township is established along Quaker principles, simplicity, truth, equality, peace, and the golden rule. Next. So where is it? Eagle land. So we're winning the Super Bowl. Just saying. <laughs> it's directly southwest of Philadelphia is where Darby Township is. Next. Okay. So a couple of years later, in nearby Germantown, four Quakers, two are Dutch and two are English, and they write a letter to their meeting, to their church, saying, we don't really understand things, can you help us out? Because we're a little thick, okay? By our reading of Christianity, slavery cannot be a Christian principle as it's contrary to the golden rule. So I actually put in here what they said, quote, there is a saying that we shall do to all men like as we would be done ourselves, making no difference of what generation, descent, or color they be. And those that steal and rob men and those that buy or purchase them, are they not all alike? Here in Pennsylvania is liberty of your conscience, which is right and reasonable. And here 
ought also to be likewise liberty of the body. Their petition is forwarded, but no action taken. However, it inspires others. Next. So as early as 1693, the Derby meeting begins working through the Chester. So what would happen is four times a year, the individual meetings would meet as a group to handle problems that were greater than just individual meetings. So as early as 1693, they meet together and the way the Quakers do it, it's by consensus. Okay, so by 1693, they have convinced their brethren in, the, in their neighborhood around them. And this is the advice that they pass up the chain of command to Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. They suggest, they advise against the importation of Negroes and urge friends not to buy slaves unless they intend to set them free. By 1775, they had succeeded. The yearly meeting, which is the top of the pyramid, agreed that you could be a slaveholder or a Quaker, but you couldn't be both. Next. So this is our meeting house, still there, built in 1805. This is kind of their unspoken motto. Let thy words be few and be known by thy works. So I'm now going to show you some of the members at our meeting. Next. So first of all, in 1780, Pennsylvania is the first state to pass uh, a abolition act. And what it says is that the people that are enslaved now will remain enslaved for life. But their children at age 21 will be free. This was a compromise because the Quakers, because they were open, they allowed other people to come and move into their territory that were not Quakers, and they later lamented that this was a big mistake. Okay, but this is the best they could do. However, here's a comparison. By 1860, the year before the Civil War, we had almost three million people living in Pennsylvania, and we had zero slaves. In comparison, South Carolina had 700 and almost 4,000 people, of which 402,000 were slaves, okay? Or 57% of the population. So you're talking two different worlds, okay? Next. So in 1783, Benjamin Franklin organized a petition to Congress to abolish slavery. These are the members from the Darby meeting that signed, and you see the name John Child. So after Martha's father dies, her mother remarries John Child. Next. So in 1786, the Darby Quakers create the Friendly Society for Diffusing Useful Knowledge, which I think is a great term. And what it appears from reading through their records is that their goal is to undermine the business model of slavery. So what they begin to do, by the way, Darby is built between two large creeks. They built a series of mills. First, they are woolen textile mills, and then they evolve into flax as a alternative textile to cotton. And then they move into some uh, mixes and at one point, they're actually making uh, what they would call free produce cotton, okay? So free produce cotton means that no slave labor was involved at any step of the way in the production of this material, okay? So it's to attack the business model of slavery. They also Im import uh, a mangle wurzel beet from Germany, which is a sugar beet to begin to produce sugar from the from the ground rather than cane sugar. Next. So 1787, the US Constitutional Convention happens in Philadelphia. The Constitution is fundamentally pro-slavery and anti-democratic. And you can go through the elements. Uh, first, the Great Compromise, which is we're going to have a bicameral legislature. So you're going to have small states that have exactly the same votes as the big states. 
So today you have Wyoming that has one seventy third of the population of California, but yet have equal representation. You're going to say that blacks aren't people. However, when it comes to the southern states uh, getting representation in Congress, they are people. They're three fifths of a people. So that gives the southern states an additional 10% representation that would not be justified by their own declarations. Next is the Electoral College, where we're going to disallow the direct election of the president by the people and instead set up this artificial thing. As a result, we've had five presidents that lost the general election, but were elected, the last two being uh, Presidents Bush and Trump. And finally, the compromise on the trade of enslaved people. The, the North agreed to wait until 1808 to ban the importation of slaves. And also as part of this is the uh, Fugitive Slave Act, which required Northern states to deport any freedom seekers that had made it North. Next. Okay. In 1787, uh, a few members of the Darby Quakers start the Pennsylvania Society for the Abolition of Slavery. Their initial goal is to raise money to purchase and free enslaved people and to lobby the legislature. Next. 1793, fed, uh, Federal Fugitive Slave Act. Slave owners can now go into non-slave states and take uh, freedom seekers back signed into law by President Washington, remains the law till 1864. Next. 1803, the, the birth of Mary Hal Jackson. This is Martha's mother. Uh, born to Quaker parents, Halliday Jackson and Jane Hal. Her uh, younger brother, John, would be an accomplished scientist and educator. And he created the Sharon Female Academy, which is the first Burroughs Preparatory School in Eastern Pennsylvania prepare, to prepare women to go to university. Next. Her father was one of three Quakers that were sent on a mission to the Seneca Indians, not to uh, proselytize them, but rather as an exchange, a cultural exchange between the two groups. Next. Mary's Grandfather, Isaac Jackson, so this would be Martha's great-grandfather, was a bitter opponent of slavery and had an idea. His idea was that he was going to personally go to every Quaker slaveholder and look him straight in the eye and ask him a question. Please explain how slavery is consistent with the golden rule of do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So he visited about 1,100 slaves enslaved people to check on their well-being and their uh, owners. He got about 15% after the conversation to manumit the enslaved people that the, they held. But he kept a diary and he wrote down what their response was. His conclusion was that the love of money trumps the love of one's fellow man or the love of God. This is why, to me, history is important. We can learn the wisdom. Next. So growing up, Mary was uh, heavily influenced not only by her family, but the following meeting members. Next. Isaac Hopper. So Isaac Hopper was a, a member, uh, was a prison reformer, philanthropist, and abolitionist, a member of the Free Produce Society, this is the idea of we're only going to buy things made by free labor. Treasurer of the Anti-Slavery Society. And in 1804, he persuaded a local court to free a slave brought to Philadelphia by Pierce Butler. He was the South Carolina legislator that wrote the Constitution's Fugitive Slave Law, but made the mistake of taking him to Philadelphia. Okay, he was a conductor in the Underground Railroad he left our meeting to move to New York to coordinate efforts between Philadelphia and New York. And it's estimated that he helped about 3,000 people escape to freedom. 3,000. Next. 
Abraham Pennock, another member of our meeting, he becomes editor of the periodical, The Non-Slaveholder. He's the charter member of the Free Produce Society. Next. Thomas Garrett, Jr. So Thomas uh, was the oldest of 12 children, and one day uh, his mother had hired a free black woman to help her with all these kids. And one day his younger brother runs in, Thomas, Thomas, Fanny's been kidnapped. Okay, so he runs out to the place where she was kidnapped. And apparently slavers would come up from Maryland, and when they saw small black children or young black women, particularly of uh, childbearing age, they would literally kidnap them off the street, take them south, and sell them. I just finished reading a book called Stolen by Richard Bell. I recommend it to everyone, which is a historical uh, look at one such kidnapping case. Anyway, Thomas says, this can't stand. He gets in his wagon, he goes to the place where she was kidnapped, and he notices wagon tracks and one of the wheels was wonky. So he follows it down to South Philadelphia, then to North Philadelphia. We know all this from his diary, and what he said was, I'm a good Quaker, I have no weapons, I believe in the testimony to peace, but I gotta do something. I have to take action. So as night is descending, he comes to the house where the wagon's parked in front. He walks over and listens. He hears talking inside, his candlelight in the windows, and he gets an idea. All right, we got the building surrounded. Let the hostages out or we're coming in shooting. A few minutes later, door opens. Four black people run out. Fanny says, Thomas, switch, shh, get in the wagon. <laughs> they get in the wagon, take off home. He writes all this in his diary, and he says on the way home that God has shown him what his mission in life should be. So after a lot of thought, he moves to Wilmington, Delaware, because it's a border slave state just south of Philadelphia, about an hour. And he puts his, he's a blacksmith, he puts a sign up, he tells anyone, anybody that knows anybody that needs help getting out of the South, come see me. And a little kind of grizzly woman shows up one day by the name of Harriet Tubman. She said, I can use your help. Yes, ma'am, I'm right here to help you. So by the time that he's done, he had helped 2,700 people escape slavery. One person. Next. What do they all have in common? They all went to this school, Darby Friends School. Darby Friends School is the second school started in Pennsylvania in 1692. My dad, who made a weird face in his class picture in 1916, he was in the last class when the school shut for the pandemic and never reopened. Now I always, when I do this presentation, put my dad's picture in there because I have a 15-year-old daughter, and I point out what will happen if she makes a weird face when getting her class picture taken. It will haunt her even beyond death, okay? So just don't be doing that, all right? But it's interesting to me when I begin reading about Martha that the Darby Friends School, the curriculum is based around the golden rule, and character development was paramount. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. Next. So here are some of the members uh, were also influenced by those that came to speak at the meeting. Next. John Woolman. Many historians believe that John Woolman is the most Christ-like person besides Jesus that ever lived in America. You can read about him. Tell me what you think. So he says, and I can hardly read this, but good people can do bad things. If I purchase a man who has done nothing to forfeit his freedom, the natural right of freedom is within him, and shall I keep him and his posterity in servitude and ignorance? 
And how shall I approve of this conduct if I was in his circumstances and he in mine? He said, Christ died for all of us without distinction. And let us make the cause of the slave our own. Next. Elias Hicks. He was a traveling minister from New York that connected the peace testimony to slavery. His question was, well, where do slaves come from? Well, they're the booty of war. One tribe in Africa would make war against their neighbors. The neighboring tribe that lost, those that weren't killed, were sold. They are war booty in violation of the peace testimony. And how do we profit from the continuance of slavery? Cheap goods made by the unpaid toil of others. Slaves are stolen from their families and compelled to work against their will for nothing forever. Hicks advocates the boycott of all slave-made products. Next. Sarah Grimke, may have heard of her, in South Carolina. She did a starving in 1838 and was the first woman to speak publicly on slavery. She connects the plight of women to that of the slave and reminds us that men's treatment of both is a violation of the testimony to equality. This is 10 years before the first Women's Rights Convention. Next, Lucretia Mott. Rights are human rights and pertain to human beings without distinction of race or gender. Laws should not be made for the man or the woman, but for mankind. And why should not women seek to be the reformer? Why are you just relying on the men to do the job? She said, I do not want to show my faith by my words. I want that we may all show our faith by our works. Next. July 4th, 1827, Martha's mother goes to a festival in Philadelphia to hear the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal but they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. By the way, there's a great speech by Frederick Douglass on this topic. Martha's mother writes in her diary, O slavery, thou degrading vice, when will the honor of America be untarnished by thy odious name? O land of my birth, how I deplore thee. When will thy foul stains be washed off? Next. So Quakers were not united about aiding fugitive slaves. Some Quakers thought this would lead to violence. In a uh, Quaker newspaper, there was this comment. It's not our place to invite slaves to run for their, from their masters. Next. This leads in 1827 to a split in the meeting. Next. That's the inside of the meeting house, by the way. So the core division is, I was brought up Catholic and I uh, learned about the historical Jesus when I went to Jesuit school. And what we learned was after Jesus died, there was uh, a commotion between his followers as to which direction to go in. Paul, who had never met Jesus, his idea was that justification by faith alone was sufficient. You just needed to believe in his, his rising from the dead. However, James, the brother of, the, of Jesus, his view was that justification by faith was insufficient. It was hollow. It was incomplete. That you needed works to go along with that faith. And that's basically the question that the Darby meeting came down to. Why are we here? What is our purpose? Is it sufficient to oppose slavery just in principle, or do you need concrete actions? Fortunately, the prog progressive activists were five-sixths of the meeting, and they literally kicked out the others. From that point on, everyone is all in in the anti-slavery movement. Next. So in 1833, the women from the meeting 
go to the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society and say, we want to join. Martha's mother's involved in this. And they're like, sorry, ladies, we men have this under control. And you know what? It's getting on time for you to get home and cook dinner. So the lady's response is, we understand exactly what you're saying. So they create the first integrated all-female organization in North America called the Female Anti-Slavery Society. They go on to raise between thirty dollars and $50,000 a year to fund schools for blacks, going to slave auctions in Delaware and buying people and freeing them, speakers, the Underground Railroad, etc. Next. In 1833, the ladies also get the idea to have tokens like this struck and mixed in with the change given out in Darby area businesses. This is to get you to think. It has a picture, I don't know, can everyone see it, on the front of a woman kneeling and it says, am I not a woman and a sister? And there's also a male version. Next. So 1834. Uh, Martha's mother gets married at the Darby meeting and moves with her husband uh, a little while a pla place away into Bucks County, the adjacent county, and would have five children with him and live away from the Darby community till 1856. Next. So at her home in Bucks County, it also was a station on the Underground Railroad. And at one point, a woman came through that ended up staying for several weeks with them who had been very badly abused. And uh, what we know from uh, the records is that Martha and her sisters one night took the time to feel the wounds that this woman had on her back. And that impression remained in her head forever. Next. So in 1838, because of, of the way politics were going, Philadelphia Yearly Meeting is concerned about the increasing politicization of the meeting houses, and they instruct the abolitionists to stop meeting in meeting houses. Next. So the people at the Darby meeting, which are very much into this, they are very much involved in the funding of this building called uh, Pennsylvania Hall. And this is going to be a major meeting place for abolitionists and others. It is uh, a beautiful building. Next. And it lasts about four days. So while the ladies were having a meeting, the racists attacked and burned it down. Fortunately, they got out alive. But what it did was, is it solidified their opinion that we're all in. Next. This is the house where Martha was born. It's still there. It is now part of a park in Newtown, Pennsylvania. In 1852, her father died and the family ends up moving back to Darby. Next. So her brother, remember John Jackson, that's running the uh, Sharon Female Academy. He and two other Quakers are sent to the West Indies to check on how things are going because the British Parliament had passed a abolition law in 1833 and the question was how are they making out? So his opinion was, and I thought this is great, the peace of society is more easily preserved when the rights of all are respected. Do we need to think a minute about that? Or would that not solve the problems in America? Hmm. Next. So, in 1850, a new fugitive slave law is passed. What it says is it forces citizens to assist in the recovery of escaped slaves. It requires federal assist officers to arrest any black person accused of being a fugitive, even if there's no evidence. Okay? It also says the accused cannot ask for a jury trial, nor can they themselves give evidence. It also declares the supremacy of the federal law over states' rights 
concerning the return of slaves, and the law further exacerbates the problem of blacks being kidnapped and then sold into slavery. Because they're like, hey, I'm a free person. You want to see my picture? Sorry, you can't give us evidence. Okay? And the, the final thing that was just amazing when you read the legislation, federal commissioners were paid $5 if they ruled a person was free, but $10 if they ruled the person was a slave. Next. So this forcible thing just infuriated people. Next. So the Philadelphia yearly meeting forbids compliance with the Fugitive Slave Law. And uh, I have this quote, I can hardly read it, but it's great from Martha Schofield's mother. She said, no one is under, under any moral obligation to lend themselves as a tool to others for the commission of a crime, even when commanded by the government to do so. That's her mother. Okay. So the Quakers in our, not just our township, but in our county, they organize and tell people, if you apply for the job of slave catcher, we're going to shun and boycott you forever and your family. And we're serious. As a result, the positions are never filled. Next. So, 1860, Ann Dickinson comes to lecture at the Darby Friends School. Martha uh, goes to, to hear her speak. She's an advocate for the abolition of slavery and for women's rights. She's the first woman to give a political address before the United States Congress. She spoke on the women's place in society. She said, women should follow the dictates of their heart and the best uses of their talents. She was an inspiration to Martha. Next. So 1860 census, if you take the entire union population of almost 19 million people, there's a total of 35 people that are enslaved. If you take the southern states, the population is 12 million, of which about 4 million are enslaved people. So when people tell you the Civil War was not about slavery, they're lying. Next. So because I've encountered this, I went and did the research. And here I will read you exactly what the Vice President Alexander Stevens of the Confederacy had to say. Quote, our new government's foundations are laid in the, and its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, the subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. So the reality is that the Confederacy is the first country in the world based on the principle of white supremacy. That's a fact. Next. So also a is a fact that about 10% of the Union Army, the army that won the war, okay, consisted of black soldiers. There were at least 166 regiments that fought in 450 battles. Nearly 37,000 soldiers gave their life for our country. Their actions prove Stephen's great truth a great lie. Next. But what about states' rights? Well, Confederates said that they claimed the right to secede, but no state claimed that they were seceding for that right. The Confederates opposed states' rights. That is, when it was the right of a northern state to say, we don't want to have slavery, and we're not sending anybody back. OK? So this is the truth. This is the reality. Next. So, in 1861 came the Civil War. Nine of the 11 Darby Borough Quaker families, a total of 52 meeting members, joined the Union Army in direct violation of the peace testimony. At the end of the war, 35 people that were still alive and came back, all in a joint petition, petitioned to be readmitted, and they were all readmitted. And in the notes, 
of the meeting, their conclusion was that, that these men saw it as the greater of two evils. Do we violate the peace testimony or do we let slavery continue? Because we've been trying since 1693 to fix the problem without resorting to violence. So the conclusion was that they had anti-slavery so deep in their hearts that they had to do what they had to do. Next. So 1862, Thomas Garrett, you remember him? He meets with President Lincoln and with five other Quakers and presents the president with a petition for wide, widespread emancipation. Three months later, the Emancipation Proclamation is issued. Next. So 1862, Lucretia Mott also comes to the meeting house and says, any great change must expect opposition because it shakes the very foundation of privilege. Martha writes in her diary, I love her so much. She is so meek, yet moves on, steadily on, speaking the right and shirking the wrong. Next. So daily life for Martha during the war is doing three things. One, she's volunteering at the nearby Summit Military Hospital, which was a hospital dedicated to the treatment of those free black soldiers that fought in the war. Second, she and the other women formed what was called the Darby Sewing Society. They met from nine in the morning to six at night, seven days a week to make clothes for the freed people because they had none. Finally, she teaches on the weekends at the Bethany Mission for Colored People in Philadelphia, a black school. This is where she begins to get experience in teaching blacks. Next. So second visit by uh, Ann Dickinson and Martha wrote in a letter to a friend, only once in a century or more is women called upon to do great work. And never in the history of our nation has a young woman had such a mission. We must remember that times like these demand each of us to give every effort in this cause. Next. 1865, the war is over. Lee and the Confederate Army surrender. But it didn't mean that the South surrendered their worldview. Next. White supremacy groups would arise within a year. It's essential, in my opinion, to understand this, to understand where we are now. Next. So, unfortunately, the racist mentality continues. It's what we confront today. Next. So, how African-American are the African-American people? I heard this on NPR and felt compelled to put it in my presentation. At Bartram, we had a number of students which were first generation or maybe second generation from West Africa, but they're the minority in America. So, it, that is, not even 30%. So the 71% of Americans, of African Americans that are here, okay, they can trace their ancestry back to about 410,000 enslaved people, of which about 40% came through Charleston. Of that group, what I find is amazing is that 99.7% have been here by 1820. My family showed up in 1860. So the reality is that African Americans built America. You need to know that, okay? It's also a reality, and this is all based on DNA science, that about each uh, African American has about 24% European DNA and less than 1% Native American DNA. Dr. Henry Louis Gates has been doing a lot of research on this, and I refer you to him for more information, but it's very interesting. Next. So April 11th, President Lincoln gives his last speech from a window at the White House. He calls for reconciliation, and he says, we all need to work together to fix our country. Three days later, he'd be shot dead. Next. So Martha responds to that. For her, the murder of the president was a tipping point. She, as a seasoned teacher, decides to apply to, for a teaching position in the South. 
she would spend the rest of her adult life fighting for equal rights for women and blacks. Next. So the Bureau of Refugees, Freeman, and Abandoned Lands was created, and that institution was to deal with the approximately four and a half million people that had no formal education, housing, possessions, or employment. The Freeman's Bureau was set up to deal with those issues. Next. So Martha and her colleagues knew that they would be starting from scratch because starting in 1739, it became illegal to educate blacks in South Carolina. Next. So going south. So in 1865, Martha and one other teacher, Mary Sharp, go to Rockville in Wadmala, which is an island just south of Charleston. There they find about 1,400 blacks that had been following in the wake of the Union Army's march through the South. When the Union Army got to Wadmala, the war was over, the Navy came and picked them up and took them back north, and all these people were there with simply what they had brought with them, which was close to nothing. Next. So I just want to mention for a moment what could have been. So uh, in January of that year, uh, 20 black ministers were summoned by General Sherman and the Secretary of War to a meeting to talk about the future. And they were asked, what do you need to help your people? And they said, the best way we can take care of ourselves is to have land. We prefer to live by ourselves to be self-governing because there's a prejudice in the South that will take years to overcome. Next. So the army began distributing the 400,000 acres of confiscated land that they had, along with the surplus of army mules that were used to, for logistic purposes that weren't needed anymore because the army left. I suggest to you that we would have had a profoundly different America had this policy continued. Next. But the policy didn't continue because in May of 65, President Johnson declared amnesty for the secessionists and canceled the program, okay? On Wadmala, there was very few buildings and the church there was empty. So Martha organized it basically as a mother's home to put the mothers that were heavily pregnant and had just given birth. After a couple of weeks, the whites showed up and they demanded their building back so they could worship Jesus and put those women right out on the beach. Martha was incensed by their hypocrisy and told them, well, when you get in there, I want you to reread the teachings of Jesus and focus on that nativity thing. Okay, and maybe you'll learn something because you obviously didn't learn anything the first time you read the Bible. You missed the message. Next. So, but over the next two years, she's moved about where needed between Edisto, Johns Island, the Shaw School in Charleston, and the Village School at St. Helena. Unfortunately, it was during her time there that she gets malaria and tuberculosis and becomes very ill. At one point, she's horizontal for about 10 weeks, coughing up blood, and only through uh, the training of one of the other people who was trained as a uh, homeopathic doctor, did Martha survive. Her sister came down to help nurse her and also pick up some of the teaching duties, and that's Lydia Schofield. Next. So she goes home, gets better, and the decision then is to relocate her to Aiken, which is inland and not so much problems with malaria. So that's how she ended up in Aiken. But what she found in Aiken was very different than what she found in the Wadmala and the Sea Islands. Didn't have the malaria problem, but you had a lot of white people that were very scared about their future, and what she found was the Klan. Next. So, binary thinking. So the Southern whites could not understand why these white women were coming down here to work with the black community. The only thing they could think of was they must be mercenaries, okay? And the black people, they, they're like, they were curious. 
this, this, they hadn't had that experience before. Next. They reached out to her. They were enthusiastic. They were grateful. And there's your church. I don't need to tell you that she would worship here because there was no meeting. Next. So 1868, there's a new constitution. The blacks males are enfranchised. This gives them a majority in the legislature. This triggered a white backlash. Martha was incensed that black women were not given the right to vote as well. Next. So regarding the rights of South Carolina women, she said there's no reason why they should not be given the right to vote. She saw the church as responsible for women's submissiveness, beating them down and making them think that they weren't equal. So despite her efforts, she worked uh, with the Rollins sisters and others. She becomes the uh, first and only delegate from South Carolina, state delegate to the National Convention in 1878-79. Despite her efforts, South Carolina would reject ratification of the 19th Amendment, and it wouldn't be until it became a federal law that women had the right to vote here. Next. So what Martha was up against. So you find that she writes uh, continually letters back home about the outrages that she sees against black people in South Carolina. Next. So one day, a white mob chases a 70-year-old deaf and mute man into Martha's house. They demand that he tell them the whereabouts of someone else that they want to kill. She intervenes and gestures, this guy's a deaf mute, he can't tell you anything. They don't care, they murdered him at her house. Next. She writes in her diary, we who have been leaders to these people must not desert them in their hour of need. I would be sorry to have my house burned, but I'm willing to give up my life if necessary. I've made up my mind to this long ago, and if justice and right will come quicker for my sacrifice, I am ready. Next. This is a map of racial violence during the next 12 year period. You see about 2,000 people overall are lynched in the South. Next. This is the activities and mayhem around here. In Swarthmore College Library, there are uh, about 25 pages of handwritten notes by Martha concerning the violence. Next. The problem remains today. Next. So. Martha focuses on making the Schofield School a sanctuary. It becomes an essential part of freedom for the black community. It's a place of safety, learning, personal acceptance, confidence building, self-actualization, character building, empowerment, and independence. Next. Here's the Schofield School logo, right? Next. If you look to the left, this is the Darby logo, the ram. The reason is that Darby was a textile town based on the woolen trade, and rams and sheep provide the wool. The colors are blue and white. Next. You take it one step further and go back to Darby, England, guess what the symbol of the Darby, England is? The ram. So you see this is carried through. Next. Okay. So character building is our most important work, Martha said. Initially, she believed the rapid infusion of book learning and moral values, simplicity, truth, equality, peace, would enable the freemen to take a, reasonable, a responsible place in society. She observed that whites were intent on suppressing the blacks and that they needed education as well in a new concept of society where the races are equal. She realized that the institution of slavery was so evil, it had corrupted every person and thing it touched, and it would take generations to fix. She concluded that education aimed at reforming both attitudes as well as scholastic instruction was required for everybody. Next. 
So the violence escalated as Northern whites began to reassess their support of slave of reconstruction. Some whites rationalized that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were sufficient to compensate people for 250 years of slavery. They were tired of war and didn't want to see Civil War Part Two. And then came the election of 1876. Next. In that election, the uh, Republicans uh, were way behind. The Democrats were one vote shy of having the votes in the Electoral College to win. But they went to the Republicans and made a deal. They said, we'll give you these 20 uncontested or contested votes, which will mean that your guy will win if you agree to shut down Reconstruction. So that's the deal. So the freemen and allies were sold out. It's shameful. Next. What this meant for the school was that the Freedmen's Bureau dissolved the end of federal funds for black educational institutions, and more importantly, the end of federal troop protection in the South. Rather than give up, Martha takes matters into her own hands and becomes the school's chief fundraiser. She travels around the country seeking benefactors. Next. Martha begins a letter writing campaign to various newspapers describing the violence that she is seeing. And I find it not surprising because her eighth great grandmother, her name was Margaret Fell. Martha's middle name is Fell. She was married to the founder of the Quaker religion. Okay. And she wrote a pamphlet in 1666, pretty long time ago, on the topic of women speaking being justified, that women can be influenced by God's work, just like men can. Next. So meanwhile, at the end of the war, the North had rebuilt their system, and they had the idea of promoting this place as a vacation spot for wealthy Northern tourists, the Winter Colony. But the developers and promoters were getting upset to see Martha's letter writing campaign to Northern newspapers, because they saw it as troublesome. You're gonna scare the visitors away. And to Martha, that was the point. Change your behavior. I'll stop writing the letters. Next. So in 1880, the racists, which called themselves the Red Shirts, deployed a live leftover Civil War cannon at the black polling place and fired it off a couple of times during the day to encourage people to go home. As a result, black votes dropped by 85%. Martha wrote that this lawless standard, which has been unleashed, will come back to haunt you. Okay? The black community continued to support her to the fullest, and she saw her mission was to bear witness to the evil of the white racists. Next. Schofield School, 1882. Next. So there were competing philosophies of education. Booker T. Washington, his idea was, we need to make men carpenters, train students in an occupation so they can get jobs and provide for themselves and their family. W.E.B. Du Bois, his idea was to make carpenters men. His idea is we should train students to develop their intellectual abilities and leave the working class behind. Martha realized that 3% of her kids, that's it, came from families that had any literacy whatsoever. It was going to be a long road to get to Harvard, okay? So we got to start with where we are and work from there, okay? Also, it was interesting that Martha ran her school for eight months a year, where the standard in South Carolina was three months, okay? Next. So, one of her three mottos, thorough. Martha realized that slavery had taught bad habits because it was a way to resist right, to be sloppy, to be lazy, to not get your job done in a thorough way. She said, listen, you're not working for somebody else now, you're working for you and your family, okay? We need to turn that around, okay? She also realized that many of her students had to walk long distances to get to school and find lodging that maybe were a little shady. So she decided that she was going to have a boarding school for those students. Next. 
Next was her idea to do something and be somebody. And the challenge here was that, first of all, you had to be somebody. Well, what'd that mean? Well, many kids only have one name because there was no family name. So she would encourage them to you know, go home and, and work with mom and see what you can do. And after a while, she's like, I gotta put something down. So she would make up the family name. And for many people, that became their official name from that point on, okay? So Martha became increasingly convinced that an industrial education, teaching a trade, was the key to better race relations. So she made a rule at the school that not only did you need to know how to read, write, and do your math, but you also needed to learn a trade, okay? So by uh, 1880s, the Schofield School was becoming invaluable to the white community and <clears throat> because they were dependent on the skilled tradesmen and competent laborers that the school produced. Next. So she had a third motto, and that was not for ourselves alone. She taught that we do things now not just for us, but for future generations, like you took up a collection today. Okay. This is something I think that she learned from the Darby Quakers. And she would bring in a constant stream of accomplished role models and graduates to speak to the students to encourage them, one being Mark Matilda Evans. Next. So this is Matilda. And uh, through Martha's help, she was able to uh, find a sponsor for her to go to Quaker Oberlin College in Ohio. When she graduated from that, and showed an interest in going into medicine. In Philadelphia, we had the Women's Medical College, and I understood that Matilda stayed at Martha's mother's house for a little while, while she was able to then organize and go to school there. And I don't need to continue because we heard so eloquently earlier about Matilda. Next, diffusing hate. So one day, a group of guys come to Martha's house, and they said, well, we're here to rape and kill you. And Martha said, okay. Well, you guys look a little hungry. Would you like me to make your breakfast first? And they said, okay. I, you know, since you're going to kill me anyway, you might as well do it on a full stomach. So while she's cooking grits and bacon for them, she says, well, what is your plan? Do you plan to kill all the blacks in South Carolina? No, ma'am, there's too many of them. Can't kill them all. So what are you going to do with the rest? Well, they're, they're going to be working for me. They're going to be you know, doing the plumbing in my house and, uh, and farming. A lot of, that's hard work. And when I need some blacksmith work, they're going to make the wheels for my carriage and whatever. And she said, well, have you thought this through, gentlemen? Because probably when you kill me and, and uh, you know, I doubt anybody else is and burn the school down. I doubt anybody else is coming down from the north to run the place. So what, what are you going to do then? Oh, you're right. We hadn't thought that through. So in 1916, somebody interviewed one of these more, more did I say more? One of these people that was then at a retirement home. And he said, we came to realize that we depended on just the skills that were being taught at the Schofield School. And that had we interfered with what she was doing there, we would be hurting ourselves. The light bulb went off. Martha had diffused the haters. Next. So 1891, Martha buys the farm. So she decides that 75% of her students are coming from farms. So they better know how to run a farm. So she teams up with this guy, Booker T. Washington, and they start organizing annual farming conferences held at the Schofield School, where they bring in people that are the expert at growing whatever in the South Carolina regional area to share their expertise. Next. February 1895, Martha arranges for Susan B. Anthony to come to speak at the Aiken School and also at the Aiken Courthouse on the rights of women to vote. Next. So by 1898, 
the New York Tribune writes, the students of the Schofield School are regarded by every thinking member of the community as important factors in the progress of our state. Two years earlier, a former student had become the state superintendent of agriculture. Now, prominent local citizens sought her out and wanted to be associated with her program. Next. Taylor Lane Hospital. Again, Martha and uh, Matilda team up to create the first black owned hospital in South Carolina. Next. 1906, commencement speaker, Congressman Robert Smalls comes and speaks to the uh, Aiken students. Everybody know about him? Okay, next. So on the 50th anniversary in 1916, a joint celebration was gonna be held. And unfortunately, an invitation had been sent out to over 300. When Martha didn't show up on time that morning, as usual, somebody went to check on her and found out she had passed away at home over the night. After a massive funeral in Aiken, her body was returned to Darby for burial in the Darby Friends Cemetery, which is right out the window from my house. Next. So this is Martha's grave on the right, and she's buried with her three sisters next to her. Next. So the legacy of Martha. Well, at the time of her death, the campus consists, comprised two entire city blocks, eight buildings, the school farm was about 400 acres. Her endowment today would be worth over 3 million. There was zero debt. Martha paid cash for everything she did. At the time of her death, there were over 6,000 scholars had passed through the school. There's now 155 years of teaching everyone's children, 68 years of scholarships. And obviously we here today as her legacy. Next. So postscript. So the Scholarfield Fund was established in 1952 from some bonds that they found that initially they thought were useless, but then they're like, oh wait, they are worth money. And today my understanding is that it provides between eight and 10 scholarships per year for people to go to college. Now in my time down here, I have heard some input from people that they think that a statue of Martha is appropriate. My view is that what Martha would want is not a statue. She would want more children to go to college. And my plea to you is let's put money into a scholarship fund to continue the tradition. Next. So. I just was sitting there in meeting one day where you reflect on things and this anagram came to my head. So it's based on Martha Schofield. So we need to make good trouble like John Lewis. We need to achieve like Muhammad Ali. We need to radiate like Maya. We need to be thorough like Mr. Thoroughgood. We need to heal like Matilda. We need to advocate like Carter W. And if you don't know who they are, you need to study your African history, American history. We need to fight like Malcolm. We need to educate like Martha. We need to lead like Harriet. We need to liberate like Thomas Garrett. We need to speak like Frederick, challenge like Rosa, hope like Barack, organize like Bayard, free like Sojourner, inspire like Oprah, elucidate like Baldwin, legislate like Abraham, and dream like Martin. Next. Thank you all. Okay, last slide. Thank you all.
What you're going through You're gonna make it God's gonna see you through So hold your head up And put a smile on your face This is only a test But it won't last no way Get ready For your blessing Get ready For your miracle Get ready for your blessing, get ready for your miracle. I know you've been hurting deep down inside, but let me encourage you, it's going to be all right. Troubles and trials come to make you strong. Keep on believing, you keep holding on. Say, so get ready. Your blessing, get ready for your miracle. Get ready for your blessing, get ready for your miracle. Tell your neighbor, say, God's got a blessing. Look somebody right in the face, say, God's got a blessing. Tell them again, say, God's got a blessing. Oh, yeah, yeah, God's got a blessing. Real quick, just tell them, say, God's got a blessing. God's got a blessing. God's got a blessing. With your name on it. Say, God's got a blessing. God's got a blessing. God's got a blessing. With your name on it. about critical race theory. And God's going to bring critical race theory forward. Sir. And it's just an up upsurgence of notice. And uh, as we said earlier, that God certainly tell us to look back so we know there's a resistance to study of the truth of history throughout school, through our, in our education systems. And they're using those excuses to actually put themselves in a position to turn back the hands of time. But let us continue to know that knowledge is power. But the key is what knowledge is power. So let us know that today. Okay, well, we thank God for all that has transpired. Uh, we're going to have our presentations now. And um, the first group of ladies, these wonderful ladies, uh, and worked at Martha Schofield, uh, we're going to call up, there's five of them. But actually, they represent the whole crew in the kitchen and those that cleaned up. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I was glad my grandma didn't work in the cafeteria. Because I remember some of my classmates, they, 
And so I call your mama. She come out of that kitchen. She going to fix you up. So we want to talk. We want to first, our first uh, awardees for the day. Um, our first one, I'm going to call the five names together. And we're going to have some. We know that time has moved on. And, you know, of all of them, these five represent those who God even has called home, passed and called home. And I think about uh, the, the custodians and the kitchen workers, they took care of us. And um, one of my favorite was Duke Wembley. Everybody knew Duke. And if you could stand and talk to him while he blowing that cigar smoke in your face. No, but. He was one of my favorite, but all of them was our favorite in the in the in the in the lunch line. Uh, we used to, you know, that they would correct us. We wouldn't be out of order for long because somebody mama was back there looking at you. But our first uh, name is Mrs. Louise Adams. Mrs. Louise Adams, and all right, well, will you come up? And as he comes, we, we just want to say to these ladies, thank you. Uh, thank you for the memories. Thank you for the years. And thank you for just the way you took care of us during those high school years. Okay, okay. I just want to present that to you if someone if they do want to get a picture of you. Mm -hmm. And your name? I'm Andrew. Andrew Adams. This is Tony. Andrew Tony. Tony. Yeah. Andrew Tony. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Congratulations. <laughs> Yeah, God bless you. Mrs. Louise Seawright. Right, we thank you for your service. It is all to God be the glory. We want to take a picture with you. This is Elizabeth Jenkins. our thought that we would give them a gift that they could they could use and feel
thank you, Miss. Thank you. Miss Geneva Key. Mrs. Rosa Davis. Clyburn, and you got to leave. Why don't you step right up here right now, if you will, before you go. Uh, why don't we give everybody a hand clap of praise for Miss Rosie Davis. We're going to ask the Honorable William Clyburn to come up. Why don't you give a hand clap of praise? And... and it reads, it reads, Working the Legacy, Martha Schofield Founders Award presented to the Honorable William and Beverly Clyburn for faithful and dedicated service in education, family, and community, presented by the Martha Schofield Alumni and Legacy Committee, Saturday, February the 4th, 2023. Thank you. Don't don't get no speeding ticket, Coach. I want to acknowledge a couple of people here. Over the years, where well, the last three years we've been given this award, this event we we want to acknowledge Sister uh, the late Ada Boyton. Uh, she's responsible for this Founders Day program. And the Lord has called her home. And But Sister Ada loved doing Martha Schofield's Founders Day program. Every year this time, she did not relent to have this program. So why don't we give God a blessing hand for her? I'm going to ask, um, I want to acknowledge over the years having the program. In the 60s, there was a group of people that crossed over the threshold of integration. And these were the white teachers that came into Martha Schofield. And this year I was looking to see who was available and most of them have passed and gone home. So I'm going to ask, there was one gentleman that I knew, he didn't teach at Schofield, but he was close to Schofield. And at the time, he had a relative at Schofield. I'm going to ask um, 
It's the Nick, Nick Jean cake to come up, if he will. I don't know if y'all remember Mr. Jean cake. He, he taught at Aiken High. Coach Clyburn and Coach Jackson, and um, uh, he taught at Aiken High. His wife at the time taught us, and her name was Miss Wilson before they got married, and uh, his ex-wife, that is, and uh, Jennifer. Jennifer, Jennifer, yeah, I remember when she first came, and um, and there were other teachers like Mrs. Parks, Miss Warren. There was in the staff. Uh, in the staff was Miss Pollock and uh, several teachers, but we had not had a chance to acknowledge that moment. That was a moment that Martha Schofield lived for also. So uh, we want to present you with just a token uh, for being that teacher that I remember and a lot of us remember. I know we all try to remember. <laughs> Lester had asked me to come. I had uh, no idea about this, of course. But I did teach, <clears throat> teach at Aiken High from 69 to 71. Then I had a career at State Farm for 34 years. I look back on those years. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. James Taylor put the fear of the Lord. <laughs> And the students that came, and if any of you are here, you, you students here, you'll know that. In those years, I had one incident that was where I had to take a student out of the classroom down to the, to the principal's office. It was a female student, and I won't mention any names. But I enjoyed that time. And some of those kids from that day, I see them occasionally, and they still call me coach. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, right? The other gentleman was Alan, Alan Riddick, who's the, um, the spoke earlier. Uh, I don't know if he's still here. No, he had to leave. Is he still here? But we thank Alan over the years we have collaborated often about Aiken history, school history. And um, certainly we've been working together on some, always discussing where, where Aiken needs to go or where we would like Aiken to go um, with regards to school preservation and, and also with the landmarks. So we thank him and we're going to get that token of appreciation to him. Our next recipient is Mrs. Willa J. Latham. Is she here? She's with Praise God. She's here with us. Those of you who remember Miss Lannon, why don't you clap your hands? Give her a cheer. Give her that Schofield cheer. That's right. just want to say thank you.
In our efforts as we go forward this this year, we are moving forward. We, when we started back up with the Schofield alumni uh, activities, we've sort of lingered into a party mode. We've had balls and all of that good stuff. But this year, we're moving forward with our 501c3. We're looking forward to establishing uh, presence in the community and programming to engage the community and enrich lives. Um, one thing that we try to do every year is we want to make the connection between alumni and legacy. Because as Zach, Dr. Johnson said, we are, we are the youngest graduated from Schofield, but we are three scores and 10. So we want to continue this movement, this mission of Martha Schofield, and certainly reminding the legacy that they are part of us also. One gentleman that I watched as he was growing up, um, certainly I grew up with his older brothers, and I just uh, really marveled at how he moved through education and worked a lot. Um, He's a researcher, evaluator, educator, filmmaker, author, and social entrepreneur. And he's built a strong reputation for helping colleges and universities and uh, certainly organizations and individuals succeed actively involved in education. Dr. Mike Weaver. Dr. Mike, we appreciate it. We thank God for your work. Certainly every year, Dr. Mike would, we, he would take young people on an entourage. Yeah, yeah, well, we're going to get this picture. Yeah. Would you like to say anything? Again, an honor to everyone who's here, to the pastor and all the pulpit guests. Um, Graduated in High in 1982. I brought in my mother's uh, diploma from Schofield. She graduated in 1952. Mm -hmm. I brought in her diploma, her yearbook, as well as the uh, invitation that she sent out to my mother, George Diggs, uh, George Forum at the time. Uh, my brother Dan is here, and uh, <laughs> uh, so again, we're representing you know, George Forum, and again, we Our next recipient is Mrs. Thelma J. Robinson. How many ways has she served in the community? She blessed us in a minute. 
Sister Thea, Mama, see if you can give me some dreadlocks. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Our next recipient is Attorney George A. Anderson. I don't think he's present. Okay. Um, our next recipient, as everybody knows him, in Aiken, he's been on the front lines of civil rights, of education, basketball coach, big brother in the neighborhood, you name it, he's been there. I didn't know he was as smart as he was. I knew he was kind of smart, but I didn't know <laughs> he was that smart. But he's the first African-American to receive a master's in mathematics from the University of Tennessee. We're gonna call Mr. James Gallman forward at this time, please. I want to thank the Schofield Committee for thinking of me and including me. But I want all of you to know that what I do now with the NAACP as far as making sure that we are treated right, that we are treated fairly and whatnot. Yeah. And I have to say to all of you, if you're not a member of the NAACP, you're not doing your part. Membership is only $30. I encourage you to get with me before Wednesday and let me take your $30 with me to New York. No, I, we, we, we are looking for people to be members and when we walk around in the community, we can talk about who are those who really believe that we should be treated fairly. Thank you so much. Our next recipient is um, are not present today. They are in a trip. They've had some, I think they've had some death in their family. Um, the Honorable Lessie B. Price, and I think Brother Tony Price is here to receive her award. God's Afternoon Church. I know y'all were looking for a prettier version up here, but um, this is what you got. <laughs> um, on behalf of my mom, I'm accepting this award. I always wondered as a kid, you take the award home and you give it to the actual recipient. So I, I guess I'm gonna give it to the recipient. Um, I was looking at the title of Work and the Legacy and uh, you know what my legacy moment with my mom is? Pizza Saturdays. Pizza Saturdays. And the reason why Pizza Saturdays was so monumental, um, it started with us making pizzas. And then when we were on Red Street, for those of you who all remember, we had a basketball goal. It became the community center. <laughs> And every Saturday, my mom would make pizzas that she was available. So the community would come over, eat pizza, drink Kool-Aid, and have my boom box blowing and you know, telling what was playing on it. But I thought about that today, and uh, that's working a legacy, because you're, you're opening your home to kids that you don't know. And I guess my mission for everybody here is that's what we need to get back to to work on these legacies. She's on a plane back. She did have a funeral today. My dad, my mom was just coming back from a funeral. But um, she had some business, um, I think in Philadelphia and Washington, and that's working on legacy. So she's 
everywhere like she always is. So thank you again, the Schofield Legacy Committee for selecting her and um, everyone have a good day. I wasn't supposed to be here, so that's another story. Remember we talked about that earlier? <laughs> Yes, uh, give him a hand. Yeah. Our next recipient is the Honorable Willa H. Hightower, Jr. He's not present, okay. Dr. Alexander Pope, Jr. Dr. Pope is not a, a, a unfamiliar name. Not only is he what we call a tall timber in the gospel, he is one that believes in community service. And for years with the education at Bettis Academy, the work they've been doing, um, we just want to show a token of our appreciation for your work in so many Thank you so much, Reverend Small, and to the committee for thinking of me to honor me in such a wonderful occasion. To many of you, you may not know that I am the only African American who have received the key to the city of North Augusta. Not only am I the only African American to receive the key to the city of North Augusta, but I'm the only person that have ever received the key to the city of North Augusta. Again, thank you. God bless you. This next gentleman, if you talk about love in Schofield, and he bleeds brown and gold. Representative Ernest G. Smith. Thank you all so much. You know, it is said that one thing, and my parents told me this, one thing that you should always remember, people may not remember what you say, but they will always remember the way you make them feel. Always. You all have made my heart happy, truly. Thank you so very much. Our next recipient is a longtime laborer in so many venues, so many capacities uh, throughout Aiken and beyond Aiken, uh, veteran, you name it. Uh, he's just done so much in so many ways. Deacon Richard Johnson, Jr.
To Reverend Smalls and to the Schofield Legacy Committee, thank you very kindly for acknowledging me or for presenting me with this beautiful trophy. Thank you so much for recognizing me out of all the people that available and uh, should be recognized. I'm one that you selected and I want you to know I thank you and I'll forever cherish this presentation. Thank you. Next recipient uh, is a legend, is a legend on the hardwood. <laughs> and certainly one who loves the community, loves poetry, shares her time with others. This is Willa, Willa Amma Finch. I really don't want to say anything except thank you. And I um, consider myself the least of all who have come before me. And I'm just honored to be numbered. And I, um, I, I do love the community and I bleed, as my brother said, brown and gold. And I um, am just honored to be before all of you, and I, I thank you, and to God be all the glory. Thank you. Our next recipient is, and, and you know, anything you do is, is good to have good help and good strength, good people that walk with you and, and get into the trenches with the work and everything that's being done. Our next recipients are Mr. and Mrs. Marvin and Delores Harris. dedicated to this cause. Anything we ask of them, they were always ready. Our next recipient is Miss Margie Allen Jones. She'll catch a penny before it hit the ground. <laughs> she is a great, great community worker, great person. To in, in, in anything you need done, she's right there. And she's precise in what she does. 
So I can't say enough about the committee and um, this committee of two, and as well as our extended committees. But I thought it was time that they be presented with the plaque that we've given for so many years, for the last three years. For Margie and the Lois and Brother Marvin, we thank God for all that you all have done. Why don't you give it to me? This includes, concludes our, oh, okay, yeah. Our next recipient is um, Mr. Harold Y. Finnegan. How we thank you for talking to you and knowing your heart and your, your, your desire for, for education and the scholarships that you spoke about and what you shared with us. The insight of Martha Schofield in a more in-depth manner than we had come to know of, allowing us to know from the front side of the Quaker and abolition movement. We just thank you. We thank you. That we are blessed to have you today. Love your, pre your presentation and the knowledge you brought forward. We look forward to working with you as we go forward. All right, well, this concludes our presentations today. I want to thank a few people, and I'm going to do my comments right now, um, Reverend Zach. I'm going to do them right now, if you don't mind. Um, I want to thank my wife, Gwen, and my <laughs> daughter, Katrina, for their work. Um, and you'll see that in a moment. We're going to ask you all to at least stop by a minute over to the annex. They have refreshments. And there's the most beautiful Schofield memorabilia table you want to see. And wonderful refreshments over there. So if you just pass through, go over and, if you, and, and let's just um, fellowship for a moment and get you some refreshments. We know the program has has it been extended somewhat, but it's been a very informative program. Did you enjoy the program? Today? I want to thank Dr. Donaldson. I want to thank uh, all of our uh, visitors from afar, um, uh, Ms. Beverly, Mohammed, uh, Michelle, Fosler Garcia, and Alan Reddick and Riddick, and all of you, Dr. Curry, who's really the one that put a lot of fire under the cultural side of this movement. Uh, I certainly want to thank Reverend Louisiana. I'm going to call her Sanders. I'm so used to calling her right, but Louisiana Sanders, and, and certainly our uh, master of ceremonies today. Uh, Zach, Reverend Dr. Zachary Johnson, I, you know he had gotten his PhD this last year. Yeah, and we want to give God a hand clap of praise. You know, when, when you see those handles, that's not a brand, that's progress. Know that today, it, it says a lot. When I see young people around us and they're continuing to get education, uh, it, it, it lets you know that we have people in all levels of this work. I want to thank Sister Katrina Brooks, uh, who's a um, counselor at Schofield and Martha Schofield. And I, I, I'm not going to be able to get everybody. I'm going to miss somebody. I always do. So, um, But we want to thank all of you for, for coming together today. I thank God for allowing such an awesome um, attendance today. 
and we're looking forward to moving forward. I want to acknowledge all ministers of the clergy um, and the musicians that were here with us today. I want to acknowledge Mount Hill, Reverend Washington, and, and the choir. And um, certainly we thank God for all of you. So let us keep on getting on. Yeah, we are just thanking all of, all of you um, that have been here with us. Um, they have some tokens of gifts for all of you that were on program. And um, so let us continue to, while we remember from whence we come, continue to make good history, continue to strive forward. Because the Lord is on our side if we continue to trust in him. Amen. 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 God bless you. Give God a hand clap of praise. We'll give it back to the pool. Let's give the Lord another hand clap of praise for all that has been done. We certainly thank all of you for your endurance of this program. And I would be remiss if I didn't even mention my wife, Sandra. Sandra, wave your hand. She's sitting there. I thank God for her. Now, now, Sandra, Sandra is from Greenville, so when I moved to Greenville, I met her there. And of course, most of the people in Greenville went to Sterling High School. And every time I see anybody my age or above that went to Sterling, they still talk about them Grant boys, them Grant brothers on a Schofield's basketball team. So uh, there's a lot of talk still about Schofield in Greenville. But again, we thank uh, God for the opportunity to be able to serve at your master's ceremony. Pray that God will continue to bless each and every one of you. We thank God certainly for all the recipients who received awards and their dedication and service. We also certainly thank uh, Mr. Harold Finnegan, and especially for the history that he gave us, not only of the Quakers, but of Martha Schofield herself. So again, we thank each and every one for all that he have, they have done. And certainly we look forward to being here again. I also want to mention this, even though we talked about those and we had those to stand who were graduates of the Schofield High School, Martha Schofield, uh, there are some that went on to be with the Lord earlier, some who are not with us now. We want to continue to remember all of them because they were, many of them, our neighbors, our siblings, our parents, friends, classmates, and teammates. So we want to continue to remember them and I will also remember them in my prayer as I conclude, if all hearts are mine, minds are clear, let us pray. Eternal and always, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much, Father, for this program. We thank you, Father, for Martha Schofield, Father. Thank you for the history that we received today, Father. Thank you for her dedication. Thank you for her heart's desire to see that uh, people of color, especially African Americans, receive the proper education that they needed so that we all would be successful in the rest of our lives. Thank you, Father, for even now as we look back and we reflect realizing that none of us would be where we are today if it had not been not only for Martha Schofield, but also for the dedication of all the teachers who taught at Martha Schofield, Father, and brought us to the point we are in our education today. Again, Father, we wanna say thank you for all that has been done. Thank you again for Lester Smalls and the committee Thank you, Father, as we're going to leave this place, but we're certainly not going to leave your presence. Your presence will continually be with us. Thank you, Father, uh, again, uh, for this facility, Friendship Baptist Church and the host pastor for allowing us to be able to be here and use uh, the facilities here for this program. And again, God, we certainly thank you for all that you've done. We're forever grateful. And we certainly, Father, until one day we reached our uh, heavenly home, we will continue to worship you, praise you, and serve you. Uh, now we also ask that you bless uh, this food that is uh, being prepared for the nourishment of our bodies. And we ask, Father, that you bless also the hands that prepared it. And, Father, as I don't want to be remiss in what I said earlier, 
for all our classmates who have already gone home, Father. We remember them at this time. We remember, Father, what they meant to us. We remember how they touch our lives. We remember how they even touch our hearts. And so, Father, we remember them as well as our teachers, those who may still even be with us and those who have gone home to be with you. Certainly, Father, all of the relationships that we've ever had has made us the people we are today. So again, we thank you and we just praise you. And now take all of us home safely that we will find our homes uh, the way they were when we left them. And we'll also remember, Father, the peace that comes from you and let us carry that peace and love wherever we go. And now unto him who's able to keep us from falling, present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And all of God's children said, amen. And amen. Have a great day.